Good morning, Chase. Good morning, Anna. Good morning, Litsy. Good morning. So just another reminder, we don't have class tomorrow. It is Friday. Uh, so I would recommend that for those of you that have not done your quiz, that during regular class time, you take the time to do that. Uh, that's what most successful students in the past have done, is they take advantage of that free day to do their assignment for the week. Um, remember, it is over chapters 18, 19, and 20. If you need a refresher over that, you can look at your book, look at your notes, or you can watch the recordings that are on YouTube. The link for that is under Canvas course module. It's at the very top. Um, and those are labeled as far as topic uh, versus chapter, and you're going to be wanting to see the ones that are about um, non-Western cultures. Any questions about your quiz at all? OK, that takes me to um, today then. We're going to continue on with our lectures. We only have two chapters left. Um, I'm trying to go a little fast so that we can open your final exam as early as possible. If you're wondering why I'm like speeding through stuff, that's why. Because I know that a bunch of you are wanting to take that early uh, for various reasons. So um, as soon as we finish lectures and meaning as soon as we're done with chapter 25, I can go ahead and open that final exam. So today we are doing chapter 24, um, which is all about uh, in between the wars. And I'm so glad that a good majority of you decided to come on time today, because as I said yesterday, the very first five minutes, we're going to be going over the information that you're going to want to know for your long essay question. Your long essay question in particular has to do with what happened with art right after World, well, during and right after World War II. Um, because of the violence in World War II and the fear that many, many people had, there was a large influx of immigrants into the United States seeking refuge. Those immigrants included, of course, artists as well. Uh, so if you remember before World War II yesterday, we were talking about what was happening in American art. Does anyone remember the main trend that was occurring with American art at that moment? American something something. <laughs> American regionalism, yes. So we were exhibiting a lot of American regionalism. It's realistic art that celebrates America. Um, when World War II happens and we have that influx of European artists, guess what's going to happen? We're going to get a lot of influence from all of those European art trends, meaning American regionalism is going to be replaced with things like Cubism, abstract artworks uh, and a lot of influence pulling from the artists that we've been talking about the last few days like Dada and so on and so forth. Um, mostly because those Europeans are coming in and a good chunk of those artists that are coming end up getting jobs in art schools as professors. So they in turn end up teaching the next generation of American artists. 
Uh, in fact, what happens during World War II is that the epicenter of the art world shifts. It was originally in Paris. That was where all of the artists wanted to live, study, learn, and work. And when World War II happens and while well, Paris is kind of, well, France is occupied for a little bit by Germany, uh, that art epicenter ends up shifting to New York when all of those European artists move over and begin to teach our American artists about their ideas and theories and concepts. So in turn, what happens to American art is that we finally see some more modern and contemporary trends in the United States. That is the answer in a nutshell. Um, such trends that follow World War II are um, abstract expressionism, color field theory paintings, and a few others that we're going to be focusing on today. So that's the primary topic of today's lesson as well as your long essay question answer. So like I said, one of the first things to pop up as of an influence due to those European artists, most of them seeking refuge in New York and teaching in art schools there, is abstract expressionism. Abstract expressionism is a culmination of the works of the Fauves, the Blue Rider group, and the Bridge group. If you remember, both the Blue Rider Group and the Bridge Group are part of German Expressionism. Expressionism is a nutshell term that we use to describe artwork that uh, is created with the artist trying to express something, a feeling, a thought, a belief. We talked about a lot of, the, a lot of other uh, expressionist works yesterday as well. Almost all of the Dada artists are expressionist in some form or fashion. Um, and abstract expressionism also reflects the work of the foes, particularly with color. Um, a lot of abstract expressionist artists believe that color reflects feelings and emotions. Uh, so if you make a large painting in shades of blue, you're probably not in the best mental state that day. Uh, one of the most popular abstract expressionist artists is Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock does non-representational abstract expressionist art. In fact, a good chunk of the artists that we're going to be talking about today do non-representational -represent abstract art, meaning they're not trying to represent any real object, um, but solely using the art as a form of expressing emotions. That quote there says that Jackson Pollock painted for the age of the atom bomb and the radio, leading back to what was happening in that time. Um, we have a lot of violence, but also a lot of new technologies popping up that help to link the world together. And his painting is very representational of the chaos and constant changes that are occurring in that time period. He's known for doing something called drip paints or action painting, uh, meaning that what he does, and I'm going to kind of illustrate it. Sorry, if you guys online, I'm going to try and stay in your frame, but he'll lay a large canvas on the floor and he will thin out paint with a lot of turpentine to where it's in a very liquid consistency and he'll walk around with a really large canvas on the floor and just drip. So that's why it's called a drip painting, and it's also why it's called an action painting, because he's constantly moving and walking around that large canvas, which you can see right there. So he's involved with um, that canvas in a very active way. And there are videos of Pollock doing this online if you're interested in watching them. But we're going to look at Jackson Pollock's Autumn Rhythm Number 30, once again an action painting as well as a drip painting. To create this, he used very controlled, um, it says dancing movements, but he was more just walking around and leaning over. Uh, but if you think that's dancing, great. <laughs> um, 
to create and place that paint. You would keep doing that over and over again with different shades, different colors, and different consistencies. Sometimes he would use a small paintbrush, sometimes a large spatula, sometimes a wooden spoon. Sometimes he just poured the entire can of paint onto the canvas, depending on how much color he was trying to achieve with that particular shade um, as far as depicting that on the canvas or how little. And he kept building up that color until he was satisfied with the end result. And here is that autumn rhythm number 30. It is a really large painting. Most Pollock paintings are rather large. One of the reasons why Pollock is considered so successful is because of media inventions in that time and the fact that he was very open as far as interacting with media. So it's around this point that we see uh, television becoming quite popular. Um, and he was glad and very open in allowing reporters to come in and interview him and film him while he was creating his paintings, which allowed him to capture a larger audience than let's say just people that go to galleries. Another abstract expressionist artist is Willem de Kooning. Willem de Kooning is very, very good friends with Jackson Pollock. They had a very tight circle. We're gonna look at another artist that was part of that circle. Uh, all of them are considered part of something called the New York of Abstract Expressionism. Uh, they worked together and discussed their art. But de Kooning created art quite a bit different from Pollock. Pollock did non-representational abstract art, like I said. Willem de Kooning actually had subject matter, so his is representational abstract art. Um, but it's a very garish depiction of his subject matter. De Kooning is most well known for his large paintings of women. Most women find his paintings very offensive, um, but that was how he chose to express his relations with females. So how he would paint them is with a very um, cat eye like shape with large, large almond shape eyes similar to what uh, we saw, well, you didn't really see it in this class, my art history class did, but the Macedonians and kind of the archaic people used very, very large eyes in their artworks and he's pulling off of that ancient trend in his women in bicycle painting that we're about to look at. He's also painted women with a very large toothy smile and grin and he's copied that same grin into the woman's necklace. And um, yeah, like I said, most women are not huge fans of how he has chosen to depict him, depict them here. So here you can see the woman, her large almond eyes and her toothy grin that has been echoed in her necklace that she's wearing, a very large bosom, a small waist, her hips kind of disappear into the bicycle, which is here. And then down below, we see her small feet. Um, so a very abstract illustration of a female that most females are not huge fans of. I don't know too many women that are a huge fan of Wilm de Kooning, um, but I mean, it's your preference. And that was just how he chose to express them. You do see some similarities with Pollock and de Kooning, particularly with de Kooning's background choices, using very blurry, large swashes of color, but not quite in the same um, artistic filigree sense that Pollock has used it here. And that takes us to the rest of the New York School that primarily focused on something called color field painting. Um, color field painting uh, was taught to these American artists once again by Europeans that are coming over. There was a particular group of European artists that were interested in the theory of colors, their power. Um, if you remember the constructivists yesterday were also very 
intrigued with the power of colors as well as shapes. Um, but these color field painting theorists also went beyond just the power of different colors and shades and hues. And to study, they studied uh, the ability of certain colors to push and pull, meaning certain colors recede into space and other colors will push forward in, out into the realm. So warm colors tend to be lighter. If you remember when we were going over colors at the very beginning of the semester, warm colors are lighter in weight. Therefore, they tend to push forward whereas cool colors are heavier in mass and tend to recede. So these color field painters are very interested in that push and pull, as well as the different emotions that can be expressed throughout the use of color. Uh, the most prominent color field painter is Mark Rothko. Mark Rothko, once again, using that push and pull that colors have, as well as the power of different colors to express themselves. His art pieces are non-representational abstract art, meaning he's not trying to represent anything. He's just trying to use colors to express his emotions and particularly his mental state. Here is one of the works of Mark Rothko. So for this painting, the blues tend to recede, whereas the warmer colors push forward. At least that's how the color theory is supposed to work. Um, I prefer, and I didn't include it because I used a different presentation last time. I didn't. I prefer to analyze his early works in juxtaposition to his final works. Um, so for those of you online, I'll share that. So his early work uh, tends to be a lot of yellows, reds, oranges, greens, your brighter, happier colors. And eventually he goes through a period of using a lot of blues. And then he ends off using primarily tones of gray and black. Um, so throughout Mark Rothko's artistic career, we can see his mental state deteriorating. Um, this is his final piece. It is located in Houston. So if you're ever in Houston, you might want to check it out. This is Mark Rothko's chapel or Rothko chapel. And like I said, it is his final art piece. Almost the entire um, canvas is covered in grays and blacks and very muted tones. Uh, shortly after painting this piece, Rothko ends up committing suicide. Uh, you think that people would have realized his cry for help since his entire painting life was based around using colors to express his emotions and all of a sudden he started painting in a bunch of blue tones and then moved on to grays and blacks. Um, but uh, unfortunately, no one really um, was able to help him. I'm sure people probably did notice, but yeah. So color field painting is all about using colors to express emotions and mental states. So a bit of a reference to surrealism as their art was also interested in uh, expressing their mental states and trying to understand their subconscious. Another color field painter which does not uh, have as sad of a story is Helen Frankenthaler. She uses an interesting technique called the staining technique. Uh, how she achieves this is she doesn't prime her canvas. So what happens when you don't prime your canvas is that the paint tends to seep through canvas as a fabric. And if you put a dye onto fabric, what happens is it ends up seeping through and spreading throughout to other areas. And that's exactly what she does with her staining technique. Um, allowing the liquid to have a bit of a freedom into that canvas fabric, she makes it look very fluid, fluid and watercolor-like, even though she's using oil paint. And her most prominent painting is Mountains and Sea, which she did in her early 20s 
on a vacation. She saw a mountain and sea in her landscape view and she decided to do a landscape painting. So this one is actually a representational abstract piece, um, but obviously extremely abstract. You can kind of make out the mountain in the back. You can see she's sketched out certain areas very vaguely with graphite um, and charcoal and then applied oil paint over top, allowing it to seep through that canvas once again. Unfortunately, Frankenthaler doesn't really do anything else that she's well known for after this one. This was like her first art piece and her last one. And that takes us to our last color field painting artist. And all this is, is uh, a group of artists that studied under a particular European that taught them these theories. Um, and that is our LG to the Spanish Republic, which is seen right here by Robert Motherwell. So yesterday I mentioned when we were going over Picasso's Guernica that we would be discussing that corrupt Spanish president again today. That would be this scene. So this is actually representational abstract art. It's a series of artwork in which Robert Motherwell has illustrated um, the uh, time period in which that corrupt Spanish president was chased out of office in that particular story. And it also signifies the birth of the contemporary Spanish Republic that exists today in their current government. In the background, you see some interior scenes seeping through. Of course, those scenes have been cut out because of the white um, images and the large black figures which actually represent the people and the characters in the story. And there's a large number of this series. Uh, I know the Fort Worth Modern has one of these as well as the Dallas Museum of Art. And that takes us to what's happening in architecture. Yesterday with architecture, we ended on the international style. Does anyone remember the main characteristics of the international style? or an example of the international style. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's primarily large boxes, such as this building right here by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, the Lever House. Um, so yesterday, our international style example was the Schroeder house, which was primarily made of concrete and done in a dish steel style. But here we see that the international style has now today incorporated a lot of glass windows and has evolved into your traditional skyscraper. Other artists such as Oscar Niemeyer try to break out of just using your basic box uh, for the international style, but still have some reflection of that style in their architecture. And that's exactly what he does with the Planalto Palace. It still has your basic glass box structure, but he's added an external skeleton, which kind of references those flying buttresses in Gothic art. Uh, if you remember, the flying buttresses were used to try and create an external skeleton for the building so that it could take the weight off of the sides. Today, with our current, um, and back then when this was made, with current technologies of steel, we don't need that external skeleton anymore. But Niemeyer has decided to reference that uh, particular trend in architecture in his Planalto Palace. which is right here. So you see in the center, we still have our basic glass box, but he's added to that box a cantilevered roof, which once again was developed by Frank Lloyd Wright, and an external skeleton system or skeletal system to the building, which references flying buttresses from the Gothic era. So it's around the 60s all the way into modern art that's being made today 
that we see architects combining multiple different styles from history together to create their structures. And we're going to see that pop up again on Monday when we go over what's happening in architecture now. They're still pulling from other art trends um, to make architecture work and more interesting than just your glass box. Of course, there are also a lot of architects that are still just focusing on that um, skyscraper like glass box international style. And that takes us to an art trend called assemblage. Assemblage comes about quite a bit after World War II, so it's not going to be something that you're going to refer to in your long essay. Um, for that long essay question, you're probably going to want to look at those first few abstract expressionists that we looked at, like Pollock, Motherwell, and Rothko. Um, because assemblage happens quite a bit after. Assemblage is just a really, really fancy word for a mixed media art piece. Um, it's just a loose conglomeration of random objects and paintings and mediums all combined together. This art term was created and coined by a man named Robert Rauschenberg, who is an artist from Dallas, Texas, and he is Texas most well-known artist. We've talked about him a few times in this class already. He is very famous for his combined paintings or his assemblage paintings, which combined abstract expressionist brushwork, printmaking, collage materials, and a bunch of random objects, which we see translated in his most famous work, Monogram which includes a abstract painting as the base of the sculpture, which has had um, the words Dada nailed to it as a reference to the Dada art movement, which Robert Rauschenberg was very inspired by the works of Champ. So that's one of the reasons why he uses a bunch of found objects in his artwork, such as the Angora goat that is standing on top of the painting. We see that here. So once again, uh, it was originally just a canvas with the words da da nailed to it. Uh, Rauschenberg did have it displayed on the wall and he kept turning it different ways to figure out how he wanted it to be. And he was never satisfied with it. So eventually he just put it on the ground and walked away. And then later on, he ended up finding a goat and tire in the dumpster and said, hey, this will make it better and put it on top and covered it in paint. So once again, assemblage, a combination of random materials. Another Robert Rauschenberg um, artwork is Tracer. Tracer uses uh, painting techniques as well as silkscreen printmaking techniques. Silkscreen comes about at this point in time. Um, and will end up eventually being used quite prevalently by the pop artists that come after these assemblage artists. And here we see Tracer, which once again combines painting and printmaking. So the background in the skyline is primarily done in oil paints, and then on top of that oil paint, he has silkscreen printed different photographs from things that he's found over top, the same way that Andy Warhol did his. Another assemblage artist besides just Rauschenberg is Edward Keenholds. Edward Keenholds is not very well liked um, by uh, Americans. There is a particular assemblage artist that we're going to be talking about after Keenholz that was very, very well liked by the American public. Um, and he kind of opens the gateway for pop artists in America after that. Keenholz, on the other hand, was not extraordinarily popular because he poked fun at middle class Americans. His entire art career was based around um, just making fun of regular middle class Americans. So that explains why middle class Americans were probably not a fan of him. 
Uh, once again, using assemblage, so you can find a lot of different random found objects as well as painting in an abstract expressionist technique. And that's exactly what we see with his John Doe um, freestanding sculpture or assemblage. So here he has found a baby stroller and a store mannequin. And he converted that baby stroller to hold the top torso of the store mannequin, which he has doused in paint and cut a hole into where the heart is, uh, painting that with red blood symbolic of blood, red paint symbolic of blood, and then putting a cross in the center, uh, as well as a little quote down at the bottom. So once again, trying to poke fun at middle Amer middle class Americans. How exactly do you guys think he was, well, what do you think he was trying to make fun of here? Anyone online? What's something that you think he was trying to say here about middle-class Americans? Don't think too hard, it's pretty obvious. He put someone in a baby stroller. So what's one thing he's trying to say? They're babies. They're big babies. Yeah. Um, he's also referencing the fact that most middle class Americans are more interested in creating your happy homes like you saw on uh, the popular TV shows from the 40s and 50s, your perfect little families that aren't actually perfect at all which is kind of what he's referencing with all of the destruction here is that even though you have your family, um, it's not quite perfect, but also calling them big babies, constantly complaining and wanting more uh, and wanting to be taken care of by people. He's also poking fun at religion there, which I think you can probably make across mm -hmm. since he installed a cross in the center of the chest. Most middle class Americans in the 40s and 50s were very religious figures um, and a lot of the artistic community was not a fan of that trend. That takes us to our last assemblage artist, the one that is actually very popular with Americans and that's Jasper Johns. Jasper Johns still combines a lot of found objects, um, but he uses a lot of symbolism in his artworks. Um, and signs that carry meanings. And the very first artwork that he releases is this one, flags. Can you grasp why he might be popular with Americans? Why might he be popular? He's patriotic. He's very patriotic. So what good American would not want to like someone whose very first art piece is uh, three canvases on top of each other with flag images over top. In fact, he made an entire series based off of just using the American flag. He was trying to reference the power of symbols, um, but in turn, he ended up becoming very famous and most people thought that he was extremely patriotic, which was a popular trend at that point in time. Uh, other artworks that Jasper Johns has made, however, is Target with Four Faces, once again using a very recognizable symbol, a target. Um, this is painted, and then he has made clay faces, another recognizable thing for clay faces. So using very recognizable imagery and objects, uh, which will eventually uh, relate to the pop artist whose main goal in life is to use popular images uh, in their artwork. Target with Four Faces is obviously not patriotic. In fact, his flag series is not even about patriotism. He was just interested in how powerful symbols can be. And he was also referencing Dada art. I mean, how hard is it to paint a target? <laughs> Um, and call it art. So referencing them with their ready-mades from Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray.
And that takes us to, oh, I'm sorry. I guess there was another assemblage. I always forget that Nikki de Saint Sal is at the very end. This is a female artist that was working in the assemblage medium. Her artwork is once again using recognizable objects and symbols to try to express her feelings at that point in time. And this particular one, Saint Sebastian or the Portrait of My Love expresses um, her relationship with her husband at that moment. It is not a positive relationship. So she took one of her husband's shirts and neckties and um, basically symbolically killed him <laughs> um, in her painting. So she references a target similarly to Jasper Johns here, but she's actually put a real target board or dart board onto the painting and attached it with real darts in the place of where his head obviously would be. And here is his shirt in which she has put a whole bunch of nails into. You can kind of see some of them sticking up, real nails, not painted on nails, and covered it with black paint, which is supposed to symbolize his blood. So she has basically killed her husband in painting format. So ev evidently uh, her husband must have done something to upset her quite a bit. But she still titled it Portrait of My Love. So interesting concept there. Sometimes people irritate us, but we still love them. That takes us to events and happenings. If you thought that Nikki St. Defal is uh, odd, then you're really going to think events and happenings are odd. Events and happenings um, go back to uh, early Dada artists, well, not really artists, but those poets. If you remember yesterday, I mentioned that the Dada poets would dress in tinfoil and wear tinfoil hats and stand on street corners and shout in gibberish. Well, events and happenings artists kind of play on that notion. A lot of events have to do with shock factor and shock value, similarly to the Dada arts. Um, some of them have to reference, well, not have to, uh, they do reference cultures. Um, they're trying to send messages across. Uh, and the first people to really make events and happenings a popular thing were the Gutai group. The Gutai group were a group of radical Japanese artists who um, decided to merge theater with arts. And that's exactly what an event or happening is. It is a show in which you will attend and the artists will do something uh, just the way you would attend a theater show to watch a play. Uh, sometimes events and happenings would be uh, in like they would tell you what was going to happen beforehand. More often than not, you won't know what you're going to go see. They're just going to say the Gutai group is performing. Come <laughs> um, and send out information about it. And then you show up and you're going to be very surprised as to what happens. The artwork that we're going to look at from the Gutai group is from one particular member, um, Saburo Murakami and his passing through in which he symbolically, well, he doesn't symbolically, he actually destroys a bunch of paper um, by running through it. So he gets large frames of paper. Um, if you're familiar with Japanese architecture, you might know that they use a lot of paper doors uh, and then they'll slide open and close and they're covered with paper to block out the sunlight and whatnot. Um, so basically he's made large frames the size of his body and covered them in paper and he's running through them. He is symbolically though um, destroying the importance of paper in Japanese history and culture as he is doing so. And like it says down at the bottom, this does foreshadow contemporary performance art in the West. Performance art is a newer art form. Um, and we'll talk about it a lot on Monday because it's a fun one. 
But here is Saburo Murakami's passing through just a little image. It's only about 30 seconds long. He runs through all of these different frames of paper um, just as much as possible as he's going through them. Once again, symbolically destroying the cultural significance of paper in Japanese history. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Japanese history, they're very well known for their um, use of paper in calligraphy arts, origami arts, and it also is once again used on their doors in traditional architecture. So it has a lot of prominence and prevalence in their history and importance, and Murakami is symbolically destroying that here. And there is a YouTube clip of this one online if you are interested in watching it, but it's 30 seconds long, and I think you probably can imagine what it looks like for someone to run through paper. Picture a football game, and you're probably on the right track. Um, another example of an event or happening is Jean Tanglet's homage to New York. Um, this particular event was designed um, for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and it is a self-constructing, self-destructing work of art. So basically, if you've ever watched those videos of someone like pushing a domino down and then all of a sudden it sets off all of these other events, with a marble running along in a car and whatnot until you get to the end and it like turns on a button or a light or something. Uh, that's what this is supposed to be. He pushed the start button at the beginning and it started to um, create a painting was the main purpose. It was supposed to make an abstract painting. And then at the end, the abstract painting was supposed to catch fire um, and destroy itself. Unfortunately, this particular event did not go as planned. Like I said, sometimes events are planned out, sometimes they are not. What ended up happening is that before that abstract painting was ever finished, the entire mechanism caught on fire, like the whole shebang. Uh, the New York Fire Department ended up being called out. Uh, people had to be evacuated from the space. Because, like I said, it was only that painting that was supposed to catch fire, not the entire machine. Um, and it caught fire before anything was ever finished. Uh, so uh, that just goes to reference the fact that sometimes events and happenings and performance art does not go as planned. Um, but this is another one that if you're interested in watching, there's a YouTube clip of it online until people were evacuated. Because <laughs> they're like, you got to go uh, towards the end and they cut out. Um, but it is interesting to see. And like I said, Jean Tangle, uh, he invited a bunch of people to go and see this machine make its painting. And that was the original intention of that event. But it changed quite a bit. So these events and happenings, like I said, are sometimes um, planned, sometimes not. Sometimes they involve the audience with a cooperative effort. Sometimes they are just the artist their own thing like Murakami here. We are going to look at next Alan Caprow and his household. He is the first person to use that term happening, but all of these fall under the idea of events and happenings. He's just the first one to coin that term. Um, but his household involved all of the viewers. So he invited particular people to come and view his happening. And when they showed up, he gave them instructions. And those viewers ended up making the happening, um, which is pretty common in events and happenings and performance art debate as well, is that the viewers will become involved. For Alan Caprow's uh, happening, he gave the men a specific set of instructions to build a house. And he gave the women viewers the instructions to build a nest and said that it was a competition between men and women and you were allowed to destroy each other's artworks to prevent the other team from winning. Um, in the end, nothing was ever really accomplished because they kept messing each other up partway through to prevent them from winning the competition. And also in the end, you can kind of see here's your men's house and your women's nest. So they're not too different. And that's referencing, of course, households 
that men and women are supposed to have these specific set roles in life. But in the end, they're all just trying to achieve the same thing, even though they're trying to outdo each other as far as the sex. I take this to pop art. Pop art pops up in the late 60s. Uh, it first appears in England. Pop art is most usually commonly associated with America, but it actually originates in the UK with the artist Richard Hamilton. That is going to be on your test. You might want to put an asterisk next to it. So pop art is all about using very recognizable imagery and mass produced images to create artworks. Um, pop art should be easily mass produced, have recognizable symbols, uh, be very cheap and easy to make, and it should be uh, appealing to the youthful masses and be a little bit kitschy as well. And that is exactly what Richard Hamilton accomplishes in his pop art work that is titled just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing, which is a parody on superficiality and materialism of popular culture. To accomplish this, he uses a lot of popular culture um, products that would have been fun for people to purchase at that point in history. But what he actually did is create an entire genre of artwork that is made referencing pop culture. Pop art, most uh, people think the name comes from the fact that it is popular art, but there's actually a very specific reason why it is called pop art, and uh, it has to do with this particular art for Hamilton and a specific object that appears in it, and I will see if you guys can pick it out in a second. Can anyone pick out the specific object that gives pop art its name? The sucker? Yeah, the Tootsie Pop. <laughs> uh, so right here you see a Tootsie Pop and that is the very specific object that uh, helps give pop art that name pop. Of course, it also translates to popular art, um, but that's what starts that trend of the name pop art there. Like I said, uh, Hamilton used a lot of uh, popular merchandise in order to uh, make a parody on materialism, but what he actually did was make an artwork that used a lot of popular imagery that he, people could easily recognize, and it made it a very popular artwork to buy. Uh, so here we see he has, uh, by the way, this is a collage, not a painting, so it's a collage of different magazine clippings. Here is a magazine advertisement uh, clipping for a vacuum cleaner, which was a new popular item for homes to own at that point in time. A record player, Tootsie Pop, canned ham, Ford motor vehicle, the theater, comic books, and the moon landing, as well as your uh, idealized male and female from that point in history. Uh, so he has once again pulled popular images from magazines and combined all of those items together to try and make a parody on that superficiality, but instead he accomplishes creating pop art. Of course, the most well-known pop artist is an American, uh, Andy Warhol. Um, he is capable of using consumer products, consumer goods, and celebrities in repetitive images and appealing to the masses. He's able also, thanks to silkscreen printing, to make many, many copies of these images very quickly and very easily. Um, 
Warhol also makes a lot of films. I know a bunch of you guys wrote about that Tate uh, retrospective in your gallery review, so I'm sure you are familiar with those films. Very interested in the power of images. The first image that we're going to be looking at is of the celebrity Marilyn Monroe. We're going to look at his Marilyn Diptych, which is a artwork that's in two pieces. Uh, for this artwork, he has used the repetitive same image to show off the fact that celebrities are in reality just packaged commodities. They are pre-made and pre-packaged. They can be made by anyone. Um, and Marilyn was a wonderful example of that. Following Marilyn Monroe's popularity, Hollywood started um, to create a lot of other very similar actresses um, doing that high-pitched voice and the same body shape as Marilyn to try to appeal to the masses. Our second artwork by Warhol is Race Riot. Race Riot is quite a bit different from that idea of selling a packaged commodity. Um, and we'll talk about that one a bit more when we get to it. It's a kind of interesting subject matter for him to use. Here is that Marilyn diptych, which we've looked at before. And Race Riot. This is just one image from Race Riot. Um, what it was is this was over in the top corner and then there was a red image, the same exact image just in red and then another one in blue and another one in blue. So it was four parts. Uh, this is just the top corner bit of Race Riot but a repetitive image just in different colors. The colors of red, white, and blue in this particular silkscreen print reference the American flag uh, because these are about the American race riots from the 60s. So here we see uh, police officers and their dogs attacking um, the peaceful protesters from those race riots. And he did several versions of this series. Part of the reason why he decided to use the same, Im same image and repeat it over and over again was to reflect the fact that America had become dull and senseless as far as how these racial issues in the South were being handled because they saw them so many times in the media and in the newspapers and on TV that they just become numb to the entire issue itself. So he was trying to educate America and say, stop being numb and ignoring this and try and do something. Um, also, he felt that America was basically just a silent bystander itself trying to ignore the entire racial issues in the South. Uh, which was the primary reason in which he created this series. It takes us to our last pop artist, Roy Lichtenstein and his Drowning Girl. Roy Lichtenstein used popular comic book image styles in his artworks, so a lot of very bright, bold primary color usage. Um, he also printed uh, in dots called Ben Day dots. So very tiny uniform dots, the same style that comic books, well, older comic books would use to print in. Um, and for his artwork, he was making a commentary on the world being obsessed with consumer goods and consumer spectacles, uh, such as comic books. Comic books are a popular consumer good. So he used that format to make commentary on them. is Drowning Girl. We've looked at this one before as well. Uh, this entire image is 
uh, in oil paints. And if you look very, very closely at Roy Lichtenstein's, you can't ever see them translate well on the internet, but if you ever get the chance to see one in person, the entire painting is done in very teeny tiny uniform dots. That takes us to minimalism. Minimalism is quite the opposite of pop art. Uh, minimalism is art referring to nothing. It's as minimal as you get. Like I said yesterday, uh, it has some historical ties to constructivism, which was all about just using shapes and colors. Um, Donald Judd, quintessential minimalist artist. He uh, didn't title any of his art pieces because he didn't want to be connected to them. Therefore, they're all untitled. Uh, also, not giving them any purpose or meaning by leaving them untitled. In fact, Donald Judd didn't even touch his art pieces. Uh, he had a factory manufacture them for him and mass produce them. So he is as distant to his artworks as he can possibly be. Most of his art pieces are made of sheet metal and other industrial materials, very impersonal. Um, there's no personal connection or expression that Donald Judd has to these art pieces. There's no context, no reference. There's just a focus on shape and color, like the constructivist. Donald Judd does have a foundation located near uh, Marfa called the Shinati Foundation in which all of his artworks are exhibited. Well, not all of them, but he made a lot of the same ones. Um, so you can see art pieces like this. Once again, it was untitled, made of stainless steel and plexiglass. This particular one is orange. The one we looked at the beginning of the semester is blue. Um, just mass producing things. So he's still using the same concept as pop artists, wanting things to be easily made and mass produced, but here he's taken away any symbolic purpose or meaning or expression or, or really thought um, with the artworks, making them as minimal as possible. That takes us to conceptualism. Conceptualism is a particular art form that a lot of people struggle to understand because it's not so much an art piece as it is an idea. Um, basically, these artists that work in this particular style make money selling ideas rather than art pieces. So for Joseph Kasuth, uh, the singular conceptual artist that we're going to be looking at because conceptual art is not extraordinarily popular. It's one of my favorites because I like the idea of being able to sell an idea. Um, but we're going to look at his one and three chairs. Uh, for these pieces, what Kosuth does is he sells his idea to a museum or gallery and the museums and galleries then make that idea. Basically, he sells instructions and they make it. So his instructions that he sells for one in three chairs are to buy a chair, take a picture of that chair, write the definition of the chair. <laughs> and then the gallery or museum or whoever bought that piece then does that and then they end up making the artwork. Kosuth himself has just sold the idea or the instructions. There are a lot of issues with conceptualism and lawyers hate conceptualist art because if it were to change hands, are you to be selling the idea or the art piece? What are you actually selling? Who owns what? Can you sell someone else's idea? Who owns that? Um, so there's a lot of law issues that pop up with this particular art style. But it is quite interesting. So this is the end creation of one in three chairs. They purchased a chair, they took a picture of the chair, they wrote the definition of the chair and then displayed them in the gallery. 
Um, all three of them are chairs, but only one of them is actually a chair. This also references Rene Magritte. This is not a pipe, uh, even though it's a picture of a pipe. It's not a pipe. Here we only have one actual chair, even though there's three different variations of chair there. Um, another example of conceptualist art, there's one particular uh, artist that sells to the gallery or museum instructions saying um, map out a five foot by seven foot section of a wall with painter's tape. Then each day for three hours for 365 days, take a graphite pencil and make small circular motions in that five foot by seven foot square. At the end of 365 days, you will have your art piece. Conceptualist art is just selling that idea, which is why it's a concept. That's why it's called conceptualism. That takes us to site-specific works and earthworks. This part we're going to go through pretty quickly because we've already talked about these before. Site-specific works are works made for a particular site. Uh, they don't work in any other location. And earthworks are artworks that are made using earth. Um, so, of course, we're going to be talking about the spiral jetty when we get to earthworks. But our first example of a site specific work is Jean Claude and Christo's wrappings. Uh, we're going to look at running fence. We've already looked at Jean Claude and Christo's work before. They wrapped that very large bridge in Germany uh, with a bunch of fabric. That is what they do. They wrapped the Florida Keys with fabric. Um, so, they go to these areas figure out the dimensions of the fabric piece they're going to need, figure out what color scheme they're going to want to use to represent that area and what's going to work best there. And then they put up the fabric or wrap the areas. These particular fabrics pieces are made for that specific location. You can't just go and transport them to another area. They won't fit those dimensions. For running fence, what Jean-Claude and Christo did is they went to California into the mountainous area that is full of cattle ranching land, and they made a very large white fence out of fabric going up and down the mountain, starting at the seacoast and going all the way inland. It involved a lot of people, a lot of volunteers. It was a very long process. If you're wondering how Jean-Claude and Christo make their money because these art pieces do not stay up permanently, uh, they make their funds by kind of once again selling their ideas. They sell their preliminary sketches and dimensions and their process as well as the end photographs. Running Fence was a very temporary art piece because it did go through a lot of cattle grazing land and uh, well, they needed that land uh, for grazing, so it was only up temporarily. For those of you online, you don't know this, but the TV just quit <laughs> in the classroom that projects for everyone in class. Let's see if we can get it back up. Well, <laughs> we might end up having to end class early today because I don't know if I'm going to be able to fix this. No, it's that one. That's so weird.
I'm sorry, guys. Projector's not in here anymore. Weird. You guys online can see stuff, right? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Didn't cost, we can't see anything anymore. Okay, well, what we're going to have to do is um, end here today and we will pick up uh, where we left off on Monday um, because the guys in class can't see anything unless they want to go and join virtually really fast. Do you guys want to do that or no? You can do that? Okay, then we'll give them some time to join virtually. Um, Maybe that'll pop back up. That's so weird. I've never had that happen. I have to email IT. I'll try and bring this around a little bit too. So very small pictures for anyone that's having issues. Uh, here is that running fence, um, which is once again just a long fabric fence. So if you go to modules, Ty, it's at the very top. Our next site specific work is um, Walter de Maria's lightning field. Um, this is another work that was made very specifically for its location. This is also a bit of an earthwork. Once again, earthworks use the landscape around them to function. So this lightning field is located in New Mexico. For anyone that's struggling, I'm going to post this presentation up on Canvas under modules as well. Um, as soon as class is done, and of course this is being recorded too. Um, but that lightning field is located in New Mexico and it's comprised of 400 stainless steel poles that are literal lightning, lightning rods for that area. That particular location of New Mexico has a lot of uh, lightning storms. So every time there's a lightning storm, those poles will attract that lightning and it's very beautiful as well as um, powerful to watch. Of course, this would not work in any random location. It wouldn't work in, let's say, Chicago because there's way too many skyscrapers out there. 
um, and the lightning wouldn't be attracted to those poles. Uh, if you want to visit the lightning field, you do have to pre-book your appointments and they do require you to pay money, but that money ends up being donated to a um, local foundation for art. And then of course our earthwork spiral jetty, we've already looked at this one as well. It's very site specific located in the Salt Lakes of Utah. Uh, once again, made of earth, made, in, made using that specific location. I'm not gonna go over all of the details again because we went over it quite a bit when we went over a site specific. <laughs> you just have to mute yourself, man. You're fine. Just mute your volume. Once again, another thing we've already talked about, uh, installations um, and uh, art environments. Installations take up an entire room uh, where the artist transforms the whole room. Our example of installation, once again, we've already looked at this before, is Yayoi Kusama's Infinity Mirror Rooms. How this works is you put a mirror opposite another mirror and what happens is that your image is reflected repeatedly infinitely, um, making it appear like it's a very large space. Even though in reality, Yayoi Kusama's mirror rooms are only about five feet by five feet wide, uh, but it looks like a very large space. And she fills those spaces with fabric objects. Right now she's making a lot of orange pumpkins, but in her early career, which is where this particular image is from, she made a lot of um, white and red polka dot phallic shapes uh, made of fabric like stuffed animals. And that takes us to feminism because yeah, Yoi Kusama was a bit of a feminist herself. Um, by the way, Kusama actually had a float in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. She is the first female artist to ever do so in our history of Macy's Day Parade. Um, but here we are going to enter into the realm of feminism. Uh, this is the second wave of feminism, in which women are trying to gain equal rights, equal pay, and all of those equalities in the workplace. Equal job opportunities and whatnot. Uh, so a lot of the feminist art is based on that idea um, of females trying to gain the right into galleries and museums, which are primarily dominated by men. Uh, there is not 50-50 equality as far as women's work and men's work being shown in galleries and museums. And these female artists are trying to change that with their artwork. The first feminist artist we're gonna look at is uh, Judy Chicago. And we're gonna look at her dinner party the dinner party is a collaborative effort between a bunch of different women. It's not just Judy Chicago, even though it's just her name that's on the piece. Um, but for the dinner party, uh, she created a triangular table with a bunch of different place settings. Every place setting is for a woman that she feels should not have been excluded from US history. This entire piece itself is about the women that she feels should be in US history textbooks, um, which are once again primarily owned by, um, well not owned, but like it's mostly men uh, that are in US history textbooks. So over here on this side, we start with our earliest female, Sacagawea. And as we go along, we end up eventually getting to our most contemporary female, Georgia O'Keeffe. You'll also notice that the table settings go from two-dimensional plates all the way to three-dimensional sculptures in the end. Every single place setting is different depending on who it's for, it's representative of them in some form or fashion. For example, for Sacagawea, she has a cowhide below it. Um, also, every place setting says the name on the tablecloth of who it is for. Every single one of those tablecloths were made by different women 
um, who are working in quilting and uh, cross stitching, which are primarily considered women's craft. Uh, so right here, Ju Judy Chicago is trying to help elevate those women's crafts and women's hobbies into a higher art form. Of course, she did design all of the sculptures herself. And if you're wondering what these little tiles are, she did hand make those tiles and on every single tile, she has written the names of other women that should be included in textbooks. So people like um, Frida Kahlo have their names on those tiles. If you ever go to that museum or if you look at it online, you'll get to see the large number of women that could have been included in textbooks if some effort was made. And that of course takes us to our next feminist artist. This is Nancy Spiro's Rebirth of Venus. Um, once again, uh, trying to gain some equality in the world uh, as far as inclusion for women. Spiro is trying to take away the classical representation of women in history as, well, the Venus, the reclining nude, that glorious, beautiful image, and show how women actually are today, which is strong and independent. Here we see that she has her um, Venus statue. Once again, this is Rebirth of Venus. So here she has referenced a classical Venus statue and has broken that Venus statue in half. And out of that statue is this woman running, referencing a female Olympic athlete. So once again, squashing old views of women as these precious, um, beautiful creatures and reinventing a woman as someone with strength and power. And that is actually where we're going to stop today. Tomorrow we're going to pick up on performance art, which is what ends up coming of, well not tomorrow, but on Monday. That's what ends up uh, being made of those events and happenings that we talked about earlier, is they will eventually become performance art pieces. Um, of course, I will stick around on here for a few more minutes to help anyone that needs assistance. Reminder that you do have that quiz that you need to do tomorrow. Um, keep that in mind. And then on Monday, we will go over performance art, which there's only one that we're going to look at, and chapter 25, which is very, very short. So we should be ready for our final to open on Tuesday then for you guys to take. So be ready for that. I would recommend that you guys come on Monday and Tuesday because there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be going over for your final exam. Um, like I said, I'm going to stick around here for questions. But other than that, you guys are free to go. Have a wonderful weekend. I will see you all on Monday, hopefully with a working uh, TV screen. Ty, you need to check your email. Yeah, no, okay. Sorry. You saw it? Yeah. yeah, they don't let me take it through emails anymore. Yeah. It used to not matter, but now that I have to turn them into the college, they don't like them through emails. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. I really don't know what happened. I don't know what my next talk is going to be because they just went over. They don't bring it from this one.
apologize it quit like halfway through the last class i'm going to keep trying to work on it but i don't know if it's going to function oh yes oh my gosh so last class it made it all the way until the last 20 minutes of class and all of a sudden it was like no signal I was in the middle of talking and it just like blanked out with no signal. <laughs> 